Nikki King was born in Kentucky, where she saw firsthand the devastating impact of the opioid crisis. She then moved to Indiana, where she established an innovative new addiction program, which was focused on treatment and support rather than jail. It's offered through the community hospital, Margaret Mary Health, and it could serve as a model for other parts of rural America. And here she is discussing it with our Hari Srinivasan. Christian, thanks. Nikki King, thanks for joining us. Uh, Nikki, I want to ask a little bit about your story. You didn't grow up in Indiana, but yes, in Appalachia, and you came of age during this opioid crisis. Tell me a little bit about what it was like witnessing this happening around you. So I grew up in, I grew up in southeastern Kentucky. I, I remember when Oxycontin first came to the area. Um, I remember everyone talking about this medication for the first time. And, you know, when it, when it really rolled in, the big reaction that people had was, is it, is it possible to be addicted or abusing a medication that came from your doctor? Because up until then, crack was something that happened in the cities. You know, people had some sort of vague knowledge of what crack cocaine was, but nobody had ever really seen it or anything like that. You know, the big bad at that time was pot. And that was like the worst drug possibly imaginable. And so, you know, the thought that you could have something so much worse that comes through and it came from your doctor was unheard of. Yeah. Doctors helped people. They didn't addict people. And so when people started getting this medication, you know, you started to see people that just started acting funny. So suddenly they were like really fixated on this medication. When was their next refill? Uh, could they get a higher dose? You know, different things like that. It started to dominate conversations. And then you would start to have people who, you know, I, I have this various memories of people who were clearly in the early stages of addiction. And, you know, when they would walk away from a conversation, you kind of see people looking at each other like, that was weird because literally all they talk about is their medication now. Mm. And then before you know it, you've got people breaking into houses, trying to steal other people's medication or people trying to break into the doctor's office and steal their medication. And it came on so slow, but fast at the same time, because, you know, it, it this felt like isolated incidents. And I'd honestly compared a lot to the pandemic. Now, I think that a lot of people ask, you know, about the people that I saw, um, you know, who had suffered from drug addiction when I was growing up. And it was every single family who had someone who was struggling. And, you know, some people were open about it. They talked about it. They see, they saw it for what it was. But honestly, even up to the point I was in high school, some families still didn't know exactly how to account for the behaviors that they were seeing, which now in retrospect were clearly people who were struggling with a hidden addiction. Was this just normal for a kid going to school to know people or to see people who had overdosed you know i the the first time i saw an overdose i already knew what to do because we had talked about it so much at school with my friends and i was 13. and at the time i was just proud of myself for knowing what to do and for listening to those conversations and now i look back and i'm like why did a 13 year old know how to wake somebody up from an opioid overdose like that should have not ever happened yet that was just part of our normal day-to-day -day conversation um there was just friends that you know you couldn't go to their house because their parents weren't safe and it was just a given that they would come to your house and nobody ever said it out loud it was just sort of the social structure that kind of came up um around you know this and i remember the big thing to me was you know i could have sat down and i could have told you everyone who would have been dead today of an opioid overdose and i would have been right nine out of ten times how many people do you think you know that have died because of this? Hundreds, probably. At one point, I sat down, I actually tried to name it, I thought of 20 without having to actually look at Facebook. So I think that the thing that really stuck with me is if as a child, I can look around and I can see who the at-risk people are, how do we let them fall through the cracks? How did we let it get that far? Because if I'm picking up on it as a child, a professional would have picked up on it a long time before that. But there weren't any, you know what I mean? There was no intervention, not really. I mean, there were some treatment programs here and there. There's a lot of really successful drug courts that are going on in, in Eastern Kentucky and places like that. But by and large, that they're treatment interventions for people who have already developed the problem. There was nothing that was addressing the underlying issues, the underlying mental illness, which 
you know, Appalachian counties have a much higher rate of mental illness than the rest of the country. There was nothing addressing the childhood trauma. Kentucky is like, I believe the worst state in the union for child abuse, um, for kids in the foster system, you know, just these really anemic services to kind of head this stuff off. And I was really frustrated because if me and my friends could sit down and have a conversation while we were in high school about everything that would need to change to stop the drug epidemic, which we would do, you know, we would go to these really campy education things and we'd laugh about how dumb they are. And then we would talk about what we would do if we were in charge. And if we could figure it out as children, how was everybody else not seeing this? To me, it was so obvious. And every time, you know, by the time I got old enough for people to start taking me seriously on this, all I ever heard is we can't do it. There's not enough resources. You can't do it in a rural community. There's not enough people. There's not enough trained staff. There's not, you know, it's too expensive. Um, it won't be a very good program. Maybe you'll have a program, but it won't be like what, you know, the rich people can afford to send their kids to. It won't have that kind of success rate. That was all I ever heard. And to me, like I said, the solution was right there. So I put my money where my mouth is and five years of my life and a lot of my sleep. So you grew up in a place where you saw what the opioid crisis was doing. You're in a position where you can figure out how to help people. Tell me a little bit about the specifics of the program that you've built. So our program is basically a full service mental health and substance abuse clinic, as well as medication assisted treatment. Uh, we have several rural clinic locations, health center locations and the rural Midwest. We generally consider a patient population to include 65,000 people in southeastern Indiana. What do they get there? Just the fact that there is a center, that's the big difference? So in our rural area, there really aren't any other comprehensive treatment programs. You might have a little bit of individual therapy or something like that here or there from federal centers, but there's nothing like a real comprehensive treatment programs. Those are usually, especially when you talk about a program that addresses all the social determinants of health and all the different aspects of population health. So primary care, psychiatry, uh, substance use counseling, job counseling, resume training, um, child um, care waiver training, uh, stipends for work clothes, et cetera. I've lived my whole life in a rural community. I've never, I'm, other than a few years of going to school, I have never lived anywhere but rural. And all I've ever heard from our hospital is, you know, maybe we don't have this amazing, super qualified brain, neural brain surgeon that Harvard has, right? Yeah. But what we do have is community. That is our strength. We have a population that is ours. They go to church with us, or they go to church with their doctor. They see each other at Kroger. And so because we have a dedicated population, we can really leverage those relationships and they're genuine. You know, you really do want to see somebody get better from substance use disorder. You really want to do, you do want to take care of them because you went to school with their parent or, you know, and you, and you know how distraught their mom is every, every Sunday at church, she's praying every Sunday at church, she's praised that, you know, this isn't the week that her child overdoses. How can you not help? You know, how, how can you stand by? You can't, you see them every week. They're your neighbors. They are us. They are our community. And so that is all we've ever said. That's been our battle standard of rural health. This is what we do better than urban. Has the pandemic made things worse for the people that are getting these services? Oh, absolutely. So when you've got folks who are already dealing with stigma, who many of them have already burnt every bridge that they had in their life throughout their addiction, you know, they've alienated family members and friends and things like that. And then you lock them inside in social isolation during a pandemic, that becomes really difficult um, to re-engage them. In fact, you know, I know before I got into the mental health uh, profession, I would have told you that I thought that individual psychotherapy was probably the gold standard and that people who did not do individual psychotherapy and did group psychotherapy, so like group therapy appointments, was because group therapy appointments were more resource efficient, not because they were better. You know, you got one therapist, you got 20 people who need to see them, just put them in a group, that's better. But actually, what we know now is that group psychotherapy is the most effective form of addictions treatment. And a significant part of that is because uh, it helps to reintegrate people back into a supportive community of people who have similar experiences. And so for people who really crave that social interaction and they really get a boost from that supportive community, locking them inside during a pandemic has been horrific. And that's even besides the the 
collective mental trauma of surviving the pandemic, being afraid for your life, being afraid for your loved ones, not able to visit family members who are possibly at the end of their life, financial concerns. I mean, all those things compacting with, you know, trying to treat someone who is suffering with mental illness beforehand, a significant mental illness is really difficult. That said, telehealth also helped to overcome a lot of barriers that have been traditionally really difficult to overcome in rural communities. So here you are now with professional skills, able to help people who probably remind you of people that you knew growing up. Tell me if you can, do these leave an impact on you? What The ones that maybe did make it or even the ones that didn't? Oh, yeah. Um, I remember them all. I know their names. I know their faces. I know where they work. It's really creepy, but sometimes I go into where they work and I just watch them for a while and I think about how different they are. You know, they smile now. Their faces aren't hollowed out and gray. And, you know, they um, they play with their kids. They have a life again. I, I, I know all of them. They all leave an impact. Honestly, I think the bigger ones that stand out to me were the ones that weren't able to help. Before we started the program, there was a girl who was already dealing with substance use disorders, and she was a teenager. And I remember working for 16 straight hours with her to try to find some sort of mental health treatment. And she had come in as a suicide attempt. And I remember every hospital that I called arguing me that it wasn't a serious enough attempt. And I remember thinking, this is where we are. You know what I mean? When we're faced down with, you know, a, a person who is in that deep of despair, that whether or not they're so, so serious or not, that they can't cope with their lives. And we come back to this place of arguing with them that they could just do better or maybe it wasn't that serious or, you know what I mean? Yeah. That one sticks with me a little. I also want to ask a little bit about kind of the rap that Appalachia gets. I mean, you could go back as far as that image uh, of the war on poverty and Lyndon Johnson. And it seems that the region has become almost a caricature. And here we are at a time when Movies like Hillbilly Elegy, based on the book by J.D. Vance, are really popular. What, what does that do to you? This is the hardest question I think I'll never have an answer to. I've, I've had to do a lot of soul searching, that there will never be enough studying, that there will never be enough things that I know that I actually have the answer to this, because maybe, maybe there's not one. Um, yeah, to your point, the war on poverty started from about an hour from where I grew up. And the biggest thing that has always hit me is one picture, one picture hit the TV and suddenly everybody knew everything they didn't know about Eastern Kentucky. I really attribute this a lot to what Americans think about work ethic. You know, from the minute we grow up in this country, we are fed this line about the American dream. We are fed this idea that if you work hard and you're a good person, that good things will happen to you. And then you'll get a two-story house with white picket fence and golden retriever. And we cannot in our soul come to terms with the fact that that is not true for some people, because if it's not true for some people, it cannot be true for us. And we really cannot, as a culture, we can't deal with it. There's this level of cognitive dissonance where we need to believe that everybody has the option to succeed, to, to grow up and to work hard and succeed. But the truth is, if that was really how it worked, every coal miner in the world would be a millionaire right now because they work harder than anybody, but they're not. They're struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think that when they saw those pictures from the war on poverty, they needed to believe that there was a reason, that there was something wrong with the American people because they can't come to terms with the fact that there's something wrong with American society and that the American dream does not exist. And I think that we have to call attention to that. You know, for for the few of us like me and, you know, say J.D. Vance who get out and for people to listen to us and to, to put us on TV shows, thank you, and, you know, different things like that and ask us what we think. We've got a microphone and we have to use that to elevate the voices of people in our community and to talk about the systemic struggles that they have in a deck that's been largely stacked against them. And I really 
get annoyed when people use that platform to espouse how special they are. If everyone would just be like them and just work harder like them, because that plays right into the, to the you know, perception bias that everybody has. Everybody wants to believe. Everybody wants to believe there's something wrong with mountain people, and that's why they're not successful, because that is easier to stomach than some people in this country are, are not born in a position to succeed no matter what they do. I will tell you, I'm not special. I'm here because I got lucky time and time again. I, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. If I have seen further in my life, if I have accomplished one thing that was worthy, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. But you have to take a step back and look at a system where you have entire swaths of people who are dying at unprecedented rates of diseases of despair, of chronic health conditions, of poverty, just really intense poverty and all the historical factors that led up to those situations before you can even begin to understand that one person's story. How did you escape being one of those statistics? How did you get out? My grandma and my mom beat me over the head from the time I was little with get out, you know, um, see the world, do what you want to do, get an education and then come back and live the kind of life that you want. Um, you know, and it's okay if you want to, you know, be a wife and a mother and things like that, but don't get yourself in the position where that's the only option that you have because, you know, my, my mama, for example, she married young. She never had a chance to go off to college. And she used to tell me that that was always her dream and that, you know, she felt like she waited her whole life to get that opportunity and it just never came. And she used to, you know, our, the way we would bond our playtime was going over multiplication tables. She made me learn Latin because she thought the kids in the city were learning Latin and they would make fun of me one day when I got to college if I didn't know Latin, which in retrospect is really hilarious, all the things that she thought that they were learning in city yeah. schools. But, you know, I had her and I always felt like I, I owed it to her. It was her dream that I had to, that I had to live the life that she wanted, that she had given that gift to me when she passed and that it was my job to carry that baton. And um, so, I mean, that helped, but honestly, like I said, I got lucky time after time. I had teachers who would go out of their way to, you know, to foster something in me, to grow something in me. I won the lottery a thousand times over and it should not be that hard. It should not require that, but I'm glad that it was me. And I feel like I have a responsibility to pay it forward. Nikki King, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.